Hi, I'm Julia Lupton, professor of English and co-director of UCI's New Swan Shakespeare Center. I am pleased to contribute to the set of short talks on the intellectual virtues. I'm going to be talking about intellectual integrity, and I'll use Shakespeare to explore this virtue. So what is integrity? Here's how Professor Pritchard talked about integrity. Integrity involves authenticity, where one's actions, including how one treats others, are in accordance with one's deepest values. So integrity is related to honesty, but it's bigger than that. It means remaining consistent as a person by being true to oneself and one's values, even when that involves taking a risk. It could be the risk of embarrassment or public criticism or confrontation. I hate conflict, so that last one is a challenge for me. But what is intellectual integrity? Here are some other thoughts from Professor Pritchard. He says that intellectual integrity is acting in accordance, not just with oneself, but with an abiding respect for the truth. So it's that element of the truth that's important with intellectual integrity. So I wanna look at these ideas in Shakespeare's Hamlet. Hamlet is a college student, and I think Hamlet exhibits the anteater virtues. Those are the intellectual virtues of curiosity, humility, tenacity, and integrity. But Hamlet is living in extraordinary times. A ghost resembling his father has appeared to Hamlet and told him that he was murdered by his uncle. Hamlet spends much of the play trying to figure out whether this uncanny and uncertain creature has told the truth or not. What if the ghost is a devil? What if the ghost is lying to him? So, like a good researcher, he sets up an experiment, a play within a play, which dramatizes the ghost story. Now, why does he do this? Well, he wants to observe the effects of the story on his uncle. And he asks his friend Horatio to observe as well, right? Like a scientist, he enlists another observer in the experiment. Now, Professor Pritchard said that intellectual integrity involves not only the truth about other people or the world, but also the truth about oneself. That's why Shakespeare gives Hamlet five long monologues or soliloquies. And the most famous one of these soliloquies is also the most intellectual one. You guessed it, to be or not to be. Let's watch a clip. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them, To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, to the consummation devoutly to be wished. To die, to sleep. To sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. 
For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong. The proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus, the native hue of resolution is sickly though with the pale cast of thought. And enterprises of great pitch and moment, with this regard their currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Soft you now, the ferrophilia. Nymph. In thy orisons be all my sins remembered. Good, my lord. So what's this speech really about? Well, Hamlet is debating a moral question, whether or not to kill himself, one that he feels very deeply. In this soliloquy, however, he addresses it as an intellectual question. Notice how he takes himself out of the speech. There is no I here, right? It is to be or not to be. Question means topic for debate, topic for inquiry, like a paper prompt or an assignment. If life is so hard, he's asking, why do people, all people, not just himself, continue living anyway? And he decides it has something to do with the fact that we don't really know what happens when we die. And this uncertainty, he concludes, can inhibit our action slow us down, make us continue living. So how is this speech an example of intellectual integrity? Well, first, notice that Hamlet doesn't jump to conclusions. He keeps the question in his mind, even though the topic is painful and scary. Integrity means being one. And in this soliloquy, Hamlet is one with his thinking. He is present in his thought process, not in a wildly subjective way. Rather, he is present as a thinking being. That's why some commentators have associated Hamlet's to be or not to be with the philosopher Descartes' famous, I think, therefore I am. In both cases, there is an integrity of the thought process itself that the speakers recognize concerns their existence concerns who and what they are. That's intellectual integrity. Now there is an element of curiosity here as well. What is the nature of life and death? He wants to understand the truth of the matter. He is genuinely interested in the question at hand. Virtues also involve skill. You have to learn how to be virtuous. And we can see him handling the question in his mind. Just as later in the play, he's going to handle the skull of Yorick, using it as both a mirror into his own soul and a topic for intellectual consideration and debate. So this kind of mental manipulation of ideas, which involves sustained attention to difficult and even scary questions, is a skill. Finally, even though the topic is painful, maybe Hamlet also takes some pleasure in thinking carefully and well. Restless rumination is a sign of anxiety and can lead us to do terrible things to ourselves. But thoughtful, rational, disciplined thought might actually save us. Now, Professor Pritchard noted that you can't simply equate integrity 
with telling the truth. There are situations when telling the truth very bluntly can be inappropriate or dangerous or hurtful. And Shakespeare is interested in situations like that throughout his dramas. Let's take King Lear. In this play, the old king asks his three daughters to say which one loves him the most. His older daughters flatter him shamelessly. His youngest daughter, Cordelia, however, decides not to play the game. First, when he asks her what she has to say, she answers with nothing. Then, as he gets more and more angry, she says that she loves him according to her bond, no more, no less. She is speaking the truth, and this shows integrity and also courage, but she may not be sufficiently attentive to the situation. So I want you to do a thought experiment. Imagine it's Thanksgiving, and your grandpa asks all the kids to tell them which one loves him the most. And imagine that maybe grandpa is a tough old guy, not always very nice. Maybe he's been mean to your mom. Maybe he's been mean to you. What would you do? What would you say? Although we admire Cordelia for her integrity, we also watch with horror as everything falls apart. She hasn't learned how to link her integrity to judgment. She overshoots that sweet spot between too much and too little integrity. With all of the virtues, in order to hit that sweet spot, we need to exercise judgment. What's judgment? Well, it, it means observing other people, considering the whole picture, monitoring the situation. And to do that takes practice, practice and skill. Cordelia is young, she has integrity, but she doesn't have much experience yet with how to put integrity into action. Shakespeare's view of a virtuous person included integrity at its core, but he understood integrity to involve judgment, flexibility, empathy, and respect. Shakespeare wrote that life is a mingled yarn, good and ill together, and it takes intellectual integrity to train our attention on that mixture, learn to recognize it in ourselves and in others, and to make something beautiful out of it. Thank you.